My name is Joel Renner, and I want to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment on this video as you watch it so more people can see this teaching. My friend, this is Rick Renner. Yesterday, I had such a good time with you as we talked about getting into alignment with God's will for your life. And today, I'm going to talk to you about staying on track and not veering from where God called you to be. It is absolute sure that when you finally get to where you're supposed to be, something will try to cause you to veer and to go somewhere else or to do something different. I promise you that will happen because that's just what happens. And that's why you really need to know where you are supposed to be. Peter tells us that we need to make our calling and election sure. You need to really know what you're called to do. You need to make it sure, dig in your heels and say, wow, when I'm finally in my place, I'm not going to budge. But when we come to Acts chapter 18, we find that even the apostle Paul veered from the place where he was supposed to be. After all those years of struggling to get into alignment with God's plan for his life. He finally got in the right place at the right time, ministering to the right people. He was having success. And then some friends showed up and they began to pressure him. And under their pressure, they caused him to leave that place and veer to do something different. And when he did that, he immediately began to have frustration. He began to have failure, bad results. And finally, he came to himself and he said, enough of this. I'm going back to that place where I know God told me to be, to the place that God has assigned for my life. And when Paul came back to that place, guess what? Once again, anointing came, power came, success came, provision came. That's what happens when you are in God assigned place. It doesn't mean you're never going to have a problem, but when you are in God's assigned place for your life, power comes, provision comes, protection comes. You have a special protection when you were in God's assigned place for your life. And that's why I'm so glad you tuned in today, because today in the program, I'm going to teach you about not veering. And if you've been tempted to veer, get back on track. And Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that today you would open our eyes to the scriptures, take us somewhere in the Bible that we've never been before. Show us from Acts chapter 18 how we are to never veer from your call on our life. In Jesus' name. Now, I really believe today the Holy Spirit is going to open the Bible to you. So join me now as we study the Bible and not, not veering from God's assigned place for our lives. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Welcome to today's program. As I told you in the introduction today, we're going to be talking about accepting God's assigned place for your life. God really has a specific place for you. You know, just recently, I met with someone here in Moscow who said, I really want to know God's plan for my life. I'm successful, but I don't feel like I've quite stepped into the right place yet. Many people feel that way. Maybe you feel that way. You can know God's assigned place for your life. That's why I'm teaching this series, which is called Accepting God's Assigned Place for Your Life. It's five parts, comes in multiple formats, and in this series, I want to help you learn how to get unstuck from where you are and how you can transition to be in the place that God has designed for your life. Notice I call it a transition because leaving where you are to be where you're supposed to be doesn't always happen instantaneously. Sometimes it's a process. I understand that because accepting God's will for my life, many times it's been a transition. It's been something I've had to walk through. Well, that's what we find in the life of the Apostle Paul, which we're going to continue to see today in Acts chapter 18. But you should order this. It comes in multiple formats. It's five parts. And we're also offering you with it the study guide called Accepting Your God Assigned Place. The study guide is so wonderful. You will love having the study guide and having this series together because the two of these together will really reinforce each other. You're going to get this message into you. Right now, we're also offering you my book, 
which is called The Point of No Return. I wrote this book when our family first moved to the Soviet Union in 1991, when we had passed the point of no return. This book is filled with life because I wrote it at such a moment of transition in our life when we had passed the point of no return. I'm so thankful we said yes to Jesus. And so will you. When you say yes to Jesus and you finally get over your fear and your trepidation and you step into the place God has assigned for you, wow, life will just become full color. That's what this book is about. And this book is filled with common sense to help you make the transition. That's why the subtitle says, Tackling Your Next New Assignment with Courage and Common Sense. You need both. And for those who become partners, we always send a package of books. The books are Life in the Combat Zone, a book that I wrote for partners, and it is dedicated to partners. Partners, your soldiers who stand with us, as we take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And we also send Denise's little book called The Gift of Forgiveness. It's small, but it is powerful. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Many people want to go. They don't know how to go on a mission trip. They don't know how to go to all nations. Well, you can do it by becoming a partner with our ministry together we can take the verse-by-verse verse teaching of the Bible to people all over the planet, and that's what we're doing. But we can't do it by ourselves. We have to have partners who help us. And if this program has been a blessing to you, then help us make it become a blessing to somebody else by simply calling us or going online to become a partner today. And if you're already a partner, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. In Russian, we say большое спасибо, a big thank you to you for becoming a partner and help us take this ministry to people who are just crying out for answers from the Bible. But I've got my Bible. You have your Bible? Today we're going to return to Acts chapter 18, and today we're going to see that once we know the will of God for our life, once we know God's assigned place, we have to do everything we can do to make sure we do not veer from what God has called you to do. Do not veer from it. Don't let the devil push you out of it. And don't let your friends talk you out of it. But hey, let's go to Acts chapter 18, verse 1, where the Bible says, After these things, Paul departed Athens and came to Corinth. We've already seen the previous program that the Apostle Paul's primary call was to be the, minister, the apostle to the Gentiles, a minister to the Gentiles. Well, the Gentiles would not have been his first pick. His first pick would have been Jews. And we saw in the last program, in the first five years of his ministry, from city to city, he went to the, Gen to the Jew, to the Jew, to the Jew, to the Jew. He made a dash for the synagogue. He was drawn to them like a magnet is drawn to metal because he was a Jew he felt comfortable with the Jew, but that was not his primary calling. Even by his own admission, he said, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. And it took him about five years to finally really embrace the place that God had assigned for him. And that's what we find when we come to Acts chapter 18, verse 1, when the Bible says he came to Corinth. When he came to Corinth and he began to redirect to the Gentiles, that's when everything began to happen, including signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And he found great favor among the Gentiles that he had never found among the Jews. That's because he was in the right place, doing the right thing. That's what happens when you get into your God-assigned place. But when you come to Acts 18, verse 2, the Bible tells us he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. When Paul came into Corinth, he came alone from the city of Athens. He must have wondered, what awaits me when I get to the city of Corinth? Athens was a city devoted to idolatry, but it was sophisticated idolatry. Corinth was the gutter of the ancient world. In fact, it was such a gutter, if you were a drunk in any other part of the world, they didn't call you a drunk, they called you a Corinthian. Corinthians were known for debauchery, for drunkenness, for sexual immorality. It was a city filled with paganism and idolatry. Ay, ay, ay. It was really the gutter of society. And now Paul, a Jew who's called to this gutter world, he's walking into the city by himself and he just happens to find a couple who've just come from the city of Rome. In fact, the Bible says he found, the word found 
is the word heurisco. The word heurisco pictures a moment when one makes a surprising discovery. It carries an element of surprise, and it's where we get the word for eureka. They had been kicked out of Rome, the verse says, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And we know from the great historical writer Suetonicus that this is exactly what happened. The Jews in Rome were preaching Christ and were making such a ruckus that the emperor Claudius said, I've had enough of the Jews, and he kicked all Jews out of the city of Rome. So Aquila and Priscilla have been evicted from their homes evicted from their ministry, evicted from their friends. They have lost everything, and we can be sure they were wondering what has happened to us. We've lost our ministry. We've lost our home. We've lost everything. They didn't know where to go. So they went to an eastern port of Italy, boarded a ship, sailed to the city of Corinth, not because they wanted to go to Corinth. Who would want to go to Corinth, this gutter of society? But that was the next stop. So they arrived in Corinth. They disembarked on the western side of Greece, took the walk, took the road into the city of Corinth. At the very same moment, a man by the name of Paul was walking from Athens into Corinth, and the three of them bumped into each other on the way into the city. And I just love this, because even though all three of them were feeling rather despondent about the way their lives were going, God was putting them together. You know, God's always in charge. God's always working behind the scenes. And God certainly did not arrange them being evicted from Rome. But when the devil did his deal, God said, I'll fix this. I'll connect them to somebody monumental. And as they walked into Corinth, they bumped into Paul. And the Bible says they found each other, the word Eureka. It was a Eureka moment. Wow. And the Bible tells us in verse 4, Acts chapter 18, verse 4, that when Paul arrived in Corinth with Aquila and Priscilla, listen to verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews. And notice now it says, and the what? The Greeks. This is very important. Now Paul's not just speaking to Jews, but now he has thrown open the door. He has increased the sphere of his circle. And now he's also redirecting his ministry to the Greek. This word Greek does not refer to Jewish Greeks. It refers to Greeks, which is really the word for pagans or those who were idolaters. These were dark, deviant, twisted pagans. But now Paul is speaking to them as well. And that's good because we know from Acts chapter 9, verse 15, that was his primary call. He was called to be a vessel to the Gentiles. That was his primary call. So now he's coming to Corinth. He's now embracing the sphere of his influence. He's not just speaking to Jews, but now he's also beginning to address Greeks or Paul is beginning to transition into his place that God had assigned for him. It took about five years for him to get there. But the Bible says he reasoned in the synagogue. The word reasoned is the Greek word dialegomai. The word dia carries the idea of something that is very, very thorough. The second part of the word is the word lego, which is the word for speech. It literally means I say. But when you compound the two words together, it means to thoroughly discuss. He thoroughly discussed things with the Jews and with the Greeks. It means to discuss all the way through from one side all the way to the other, to go back and forth in an exchange of thoughts and ideas, or Paul really entered into fellowship and conversation both with the Jews and with the Greeks. His sphere of influence was changing. And the Bible says he persuaded them. The word persuade is the Greek word patho. And this word patho is a very important word in the New Testament. The word patho describes persuasion or one who is convinced, coaxed, or swayed from one opinion to another opinion. A person coaxed from a particular conviction to embrace a brand new conviction. A persuasion that leads to conviction and belief or absolute confidence, convinced to the core, rock core certainty. Paul is now speaking to the Jews. He's leading them to Christ. And he's also speaking to the Gentiles. Wow, this is new for him. And in fact, he found great, great favor among the Gentiles. His ministry is beginning to thrive for the first time since he left Antioch while wow, he's really having success. Why? Because he has finally accepted his God-assigned place to speak to the Gentiles. When he began to readdress his ministry to the Gentiles, that's when all of it began to come together. And then something happened in Acts chapter 18, verse 5. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul 
was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Well, when the Bible says he was pressed in the spirit, we need to look at this verse a little differently because the words in the spirit do not appear in the most ancient transcripts of the New Testament, the most ancient versions. It simply says he was pressed in the spirit does not appear in the most ancient manuscripts. And furthermore, the word press is a Greek word, suneko, and the word suneko means to be pressed, to be pressured, or to be compelled. Really carries the idea of manipulation. So think about it. Up until this moment, while Paul was in Corinth, he was only with Aquila and Priscilla. And while he was just with them, he was speaking to Jews and had increased his sphere of influence to the Gentiles. He was redirecting to the Gentiles, having success among the Gentiles. And then verse 5 says, Silas and Timothy showed up. And when Tylus, Titus and Tim Silas and Timothy showed up, suddenly Paul felt pressed. He felt compelled. He felt pressured, almost manipulated to go back to his old way of doing things to speak only to the Jews. Well, Silas and Timothy had been traveling with Paul for years. And for years, they had seen Paul go to the Jew, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew, the Jew. They had seen Paul go from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. Now they show up in Corinth. They haven't seen him for a while. And when they show up in Corinth, they're stunned. They are shocked because Paul is now speaking to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. Well, that's what he was supposed to do from the very beginning. But Silas and Timothy are not accustomed to this. And it seems that at the moment they arrived, they must have put pressure on Paul. Maybe they even said to him, what are you doing? Have you forgotten that you're a Jew? Have you forgotten that the gospel is to the Jew first? What are you doing spending all your time and all your energy speaking to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, to the pagans? You're a Jew. What has happened to you? And this happened exactly at the moment that Silas and Timothy arrived. That's why verse 18, chapter 18, verse 5 says, When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was pressed, the Greek word suneko. He was pressured, he was pressed, he was compelled, even carries the idea of a manipulation to testify to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Well, it's okay to reach the Jew, of course. They need to hear the message too. But Paul had finally gotten into his assigned place. His friends showed up. And when his friends showed up, it seems they pressured him, manipulated, maybe even guilted him to stop what he was doing and to go back into his own pattern, his old pattern of doing things. Wow. But when you come to 18 verse 6, the Bible says, when the Jews opposed themselves and blasphemed. The word oppose is even very important. It is a Greek word anti, tasso, my, the word anti means against. It carries the idea of hostility. The word tasso means to arrange yourself or to order yourself. And it was a military term used to describe troops that are militarily arranged to make an assault or to make an advance. When you put these two words together, it describes a premeditated organization a premeditated assault, a premeditated attack. The Jews in Corinth got so furious with Paul that they developed a strategy to attack him. And the verse says they even blasphemed. The word blaspheme, the Greek word blasphemeo, oh, they got really ugly. It means to slander or to accuse, to speak against or to speak derogatory words for the purpose of injuring or harming one's reputation. They verbally began to assault the Apostle Paul and his companions and accuse them of horrible derogatory things. That's what this word blasphemy means. Finally, Paul shook his raiment. The word shook means to wildly shake. It's very important to wildly or furiously shake. And really, this is a response to what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 14, Mark 6, 11, and in Luke chapter 9, verse 5, where Jesus said, if people do not receive your message, shake your garment, Wipe the dust off of your shoes. This was an indictment against the Jewish community. Paul says, I'm finished with you. In fact, he goes on and says in verse 6, I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. When Paul says, I am clean, it is a Greek word, katharos ego. The word ego means I. He's really drawing attention to himself. 
But the word katharos carries the idea of something that is cleansed, something that is pure. If you put these two words together, it really means I have finally gotten you out of my system. I'm free of you and free of your contamination. Paul finally came to himself, said, I'm done with this. I've been trying to reach you for years and years and years. After this event with you in Corinth, I'm done with you. Catharos ego, I have finally gotten you out of my system. And from henceforth, he says, I will go unto the Gentiles. From henceforth in Greek is the phrase apo to noon. The word apo is very important. It carries the idea of a separation. I'm separating from you. I'm redirecting. In this exact moment, he said, I'm going to go in another direction. Wow. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 18, verse 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Look at verse 18, verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house and many of the Corinthians, underline those two words, the Corinthians, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Those two words, the Corinthians, refers to the pagans in Corinth. That does not refer to the Jewish community. It refers to the Jewish community. When Paul made the decision, he said, I'm clean of you. I've gotten you out of my system. I'm finished directing my attention in the wrong direction. I'm going to refocus apo to noon. From this moment forward, I'm separating from you. I'm redirecting. I'm going to turn my focus to the Gentiles. Suddenly everything began to happen for him. Real success came. Crispus, the archbishop of the synagogue, that's really what the word chief ruler means. He was the chief rabbi of the synagogue. He believed with all of his house and his conversion was so dramatic. Many of the Corinthians hearing about it, many of the local pagans hearing that this chief Jew got saved, they were so impressed by this that they began to turn their attention to Paul's message. And even the Corinthians, a big multitude of Gentiles in Corinth hearing, believed, and were baptized. But along the way, Paul was pressured to veer from what God was doing in his life. If God has revealed his plan to you, you can be sure pressures will come, maybe even the voices of family and friends to try to push you or sway you to do something different. You've got to dig in your heels and say, this is where God called me. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. This is my God assigned place. And if you'll be obedient and stay in that place, you will see great fruit come into your life as it did with Paul when he finally decided he was going to stay in his God-assigned place in the city of Corinth. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. How do you get from where you are to where God wants you to be? Sometimes before you can get into the right place, you have to get unstuck from where you are. When you finally move into the place God has for you, you'll find supernatural blessings waiting for you. In the five-part series, Accepting Your God-Assigned Place, you'll learn how to identify where God wants you to be, how to get into alignment with God's plan for your life, how to overcome the fear of transition, how to adapt and thrive in God's new place for your life. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $10, this series will help you make the overdue decisions that you wanted to make for a long time. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, The Point of No Return. In this powerful book, Rick vividly describes how to take steps of faith into your God-designed future. It's time for you to stop looking across the river of change and start believing the waters will part as you step forward in faith. You can do it, but you need to know how, and that is what you'll discover in this timely book. Don't delay ordering your copy today because it will help propel you into the plan God has for you. Order your copy of The Point of No Return for only $15. Don't miss this special offer, accepting your God-assigned place and the point of no return. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey, this is Rick Renner. This is where I sit every morning, where I meet with the Lord and I pray for our TV family, our partners, people that I love all over the world. And this is where I prepare my TV programs. And I have to tell you that preparing the program is the biggest part. Filming the program is the easy part. 
It takes hours and hours and hours to make sure I've put everything together correctly for you. And then from here, it goes to the TV suite where I sit down with my producer, and then he and I go over all the introductions that I have filmed in. So good to do these programs for the people who watch us all over the world. This is our studio. This really is where I live my life. And in this room, we prepare programs that ultimately go to multiple languages all over the face of the earth. They're primarily Russian and English. Wow, what a blessing. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, verse 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. It's my prayer that our teaching is feeding and nourishing many people. But when we're finished with my part, then the programs go into the edit suite, and that's what takes place in this room. And in this room, you can see there's people doing all kinds of things. They take the Greek words that I prepare. By the way, it takes a long time to prepare all those Greek words but then they have to put them on the screen. They have to adjust the sound, adjust the color. They edit the whole program together with the music, the advertisements, the prayer, everything. And we create a teaching program for you. And our goal is to bring teaching that you can trust. That's our goal, that's my prayer. And I wanna say thank you to you for helping all of us do it. It's not just me and Denise. There's a whole team here together. We're all committed to bringing good teaching to people. And your part's very important. So thank you for being a partner. Thank you for praying for us. And thank you for giving. It is so very important for you to know what God has called you to do, your God-assigned place, and stay in it. It is for certain that voices will come to try to talk you into veering from that place. Don't veer from where God has called you. If you'll stick with it, eventually you'll see fruit. That's why I want you to get the series called Accepting Your God-Assigned Place. God has an assigned place for you, and this series is designed to help you get there and stay there. That's where you're going to see victory and fruit in your life. It comes in multiple formats, and it comes with a great study guide that you will just love. And right now, we're also offering you my book called The Point of No Return, Tackling Your Next New Assignment. That's the call of God on your life, tackling it. Sometimes you have to tackle it, but you need to tackle it with courage and common sense. People like the courage part, but God wants you to have common sense in the way that you take a step of faith. You can do both. You can have courage, you can have common sense, and the two of these together will help you get where you're supposed to be and to have victory there. So order your copy today. And I remind you that for those who become partners, and we pray that you'll become a partner if you're not already, we send a package of books as our way of saying, Welcome to the partner family. But let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much that you give us the fortitude and the strength we need to stick with our God-assigned place. Even if pressures and voices try to talk us out of it, we can make the decision to stick with your plan for our life. And Father, we thank you that in that place, we will taste victory and abundant fruit. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with me. I can hardly wait to see you again tomorrow where we're going to continue this teaching. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Wow, wasn't that a great teaching? My friends, I want to ask you to please like, subscribe, and comment on that video you just watched so more people can see it.